There is another first for the International Space Station coming up today. The next Progress vehicle is due to not only launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome this afternoon, but to dock to the International Space Station tonight. It'll be the first time that a vehicle has launched and docked to the station at the same time. We're going to get an update on how the uh, preparations for that and the reasons behind it. The Expedition 32 lead flight director, Dina Contella. Dina, thanks for taking a few minutes. Um, set the stage for us. All previous progresses and Soyuzes have taken about two days to get to the station. Um, presumably there's a very good reason that they've done so. What is it? Well, there's uh, several good reasons. Um, so the um, you know, the first is, so it takes a, um, you have a lot longer time between the launch and the time that you dock. And so that adds a lot of flexibility to the plan. Um, for, uh, for example, if you had a booster dispersion or you had some, uh, some need to do more ground tracking to narrow in on the nav state, or if you had a failure that you wanted to analyze prior to the planned docking time, uh, then you would have more time to do so. Um, one of the one of the major reasons uh, it has to do with uh, the location of ISS relative to the launch site. Uh, in the case of a thir of a two day rendezvous, you have a lot longer time to um, basically allow the the vehicle the two vehicles to meet up. So for the launch vehicle to catch up to the space station, um, if you uh, if you try to um, hurry that scheme, then as ISS flies over, it has to be in a very more specific location relative to the uh, to the launch location, and so uh, that can help. That tends to narrow your launch opportunity capability. So uh, that's another another reason why a four orbit scheme is a little bit more difficult. Um, for orbit being this for you know flight day right. one type of rendezvous. So and then um, you know additionally uh, the. What this does associated with the launch windows is it gives us fewer days uh, that we can actually uh, meet our launch window opportunity. We try to make sure that the uh, the orbital plane is aligned with the with the launch site, and so we already have that constraint. And uh, when you narrow this window of opportunity, where ISS is a, you know more directly above the launch mm -hmm. site, then you end up with fewer days that you can launch. So, for example, uh, with the 34 orbit longer scheme, this two-day scheme, you can launch about two out of every three days on a Soyuz. Uh, you know that's when the when all the parameters all line up. As you say, you had more time after launch than to refine the approach. To, to, uh, to make adjustments in order to bring the two vehicles together. Well, that's true. Uh, that's true. And also, of course, I was, you know, it uh, affects your opportunity for launch. So, you know, you can't launch when ISS is on the other side of the world. But you have more flexibility if you have a lot longer rendezvous scheme versus if you have a much shorter one. More time to so. make up the difference. That's right, okay. exactly. What advantages then are, are could, could be gained from doing it this way and doing it on the same day? Uh, well, so this, the intended applicability for this is actually for the Soyuz, which is what, you know, we use to carry the, um, to carry our crew members to, to the space station. And so there's a few advantages from a human perspective. Uh, first of all, um, the, the Soyuz vehicle, you know, if you get there faster, you can imagine that the crew discomfort being an uncramped vehicle um, would be reduced. Um, and also the vehicle itself, um, it, it does a solar, it goes into a solar spin attitude part of its um, trajectory on the way to space station. So it has a very, um, it has a spin associated with it, which, um, you know, is not necessarily always noticeable, but it could be more, could cause more discomfort for the crew. And I don't think most people are aware of that, that th this is not a really fast spin. No, no, it's not. It's just something that allows for um, better pointing to the sun for uh, power generation, but it's not like a, an extremely fast spin. It's just something that um, some crew members um, have noticed in the past as something that in this period of space adaptation right after launch, um, it would be better if they were in a more stable environment. So trying to get to the amenities of ISS, you know, with a full toilet and a sleep station and all those things, um, trying to get there in a hurry, you can see that there would be an advantage to that. Mm -hmm. And from a vehicle perspective, um, you have a, a limited number of consumables on board uh, on board the Soyuz. So if you say some of those type of life support type of consumables, then uh, you would have that on the back end. So after Soyuz docks, now you have some margin in case you need it for, uh, you know, after undocking, then you would have more life support capability. So there are a few advantages to, to doing this with the four orbit scheme as well. Uh, well. I think that we've heard in the past that one of the advantages of the, the longer trip of two days was to give crew members an opportunity to become adapted to the environment. Um, I suppose they can do that adaptation in a larger area. 
Well, uh, that's true. Um, and so, you know, we still have kind of a lot of work to make sure we understand exactly the space adaptation piece of it. Um, you know, I think getting there sooner in this particular case, it's much, much sooner. I mean, we're talking you launch and then six hours later you're at the space station. So it could be that you actually arrive before you really into a space adaptation situation, um, you know, as opposed to something in between. So uh, anyway, but our, our uh, astronaut corps will be looking at this from a Soyuz perspective pretty carefully to make sure we understand, you know, are we going to get an opportunity to have the crew members get out of their Sokol suits, their space suits in this, in this time frame? And we have a, a few questions associated with it, but um, probably all in all from a crew comfort standpoint, uh, there could be some advantages. And as we say, the, the ultimate design here is to use this for Soyuz, is not to necessarily use it for progresses all the time. This is a test. That's exactly right. Its intended applicability, like I said, is for the Soyuz. They um, have done they have done some testing on progresses, and they're going to do more testing on progresses before we try it on a Soyuz. So it'll be um, closer to more than a year out before we would even uh, attempt it with a Soyuz. From the point of view of you and your team in this room, how does it change uh, y your preparations and in, in, in getting ready and then executing uh, what's going to happen today? Uh, well, from the mission control standpoint, you know, we've had uh, trajectory officers and our visiting vehicle officers have been studying the situation and working with our Russian colleagues for quite some time. So the sort of preparation leading up to today has been pretty extensive. Um, but, you know, we're, we're ready, and our both our trajectory and our visiting vehicle folks are going to be carefully monitoring um, the progress of the progress mm -hmm. and um, today. So from uh, from this standpoint, you know, if anything, it's a much shorter shift. You know, instead of two days, it's a day. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be interesting to see, to see it all happen in one day. Um, also, from a planning perspective with our crew members, um, for a docking, we typically would have our crew awake. Um, and so we have six crew members on board, three of them are Russian, and those three Russians are, are sleep shifting. Um, and so they're um, they're going to go to bed at a different time than our U.S. crew members. This is kind of a new way to do business. And um, then our U.S. crew members are going to have a sleep period during the docking time frame, but are just going to get up just to see the docking, um, so just in case some contingency happens, uh, that sort of thing, and just to monitor the docking. So um, we are doing what's called a split shift, and so it's a little bit different. And so from you know you know our planners have been working very closely with the Russian planners and trying to make sure that we don't accidentally wake up uh, the Russian crew when they're asleep. Right when we're trying to talk to the U.S. crew and uh, trying to make sure that the activities uh, and, you know, we have a Russian crew member that sleeps in the U.S. segment, trying to make sure that we don't do any activities right in his module and that sort of thing. So there have been a few other preparations that I would consider non-standard, but are, we're actually learning there's some advantages to doing this, and it really helps our U.S. crew members to not have to sleep shift and sleep shift back and that sort of thing. So uh, we are seeing, we're, we're finding a lot out that actually we like about this scheme. So. Would you imagine then that this afternoon and this evening what actually gets done in this room is the same as what was done before, just shorter? Uh, that's exactly right. So the, the change here is really um, in the first two orbits, the first two orbits of the progress, and then around two and a half hours or so prior to the docking, everything becomes standard. So uh, it's exactly the same rendezvous that we've always done, and it's the same for the crew. Um, no procedures, no training differences or anything like that. So really what's changed is the first two orbits, we're getting there faster, and we're getting up to the point of the automated rendezvous docking sequence um, a lot faster, and nothing after that has changed. So I anticipate that watching the rendezvous docking will be just like any other rendezvous docking uh, case that we've had. And we're just extremely interested in seeing those first couple of orbits and making sure that the, that, that goes well. I, I do want to mention associated with those first two orbits that on um, 47 Progress launch, they did try a scheme like this um, with a similar ground uh, targeting. But of course, they took the full amount of time to get there, the full 34 mm -hmm. orbits to get to station. But they did do some, uh, some testing on the 47 Progress launch. So I'm feeling uh, like this should probably go well today. I assume that at some point, or up to some point, they could change your mind and go back to the regular two-day approach. Yeah, so w we have had um, a lot of discussions about that, and we are absolutely ready to download to a 34-orbit scheme. We have all of our analysis in place for all of our solar rays, and we are um, definitely good to go. That would put it on Friday. That would put our docking uh, on Friday, and our team is prepared to go and execute that plan as well. So if our Russian colleagues get uncomfortable or find that they can't do the scheme that they had planned, then uh, our plan is just to download to a nominal standard docking time frame. Is there some deadline by which you have to make that decision? Well, uh, you know, I talked about 
two and a half hours prior to the uh, to the start right. of docking is when they kick off the automated rendezvous and docking sequence. And so um, really any time up to then, we could make that call. It could be that right away they decide, you know, they have some sort of issue with their ground targeting or something like that, and then we all know in advance. Or it could be that you're leading right up to the event and you realize that, you know, maybe you're not in the spot that you had anticipated you'd be, and so it's time to call it off. So, And then once you get into the automated rendezvous and docking sequence, you can always call it off at that point, uh, just as we always can with standard abort. So. Just as we learned last week. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So every, at this point, everything is still on schedule and ready to go. Yeah, so this morning we did what's called an uh, optimal propellant maneuver, which is a new maneuver that we just happened to have a new maneuver associated with the same uh, progress vehicle, uh, where we did we flew um, a trajectory, which is a pr very propellant, smart pr trajectory, uh, which helps us save uh, on our propellant. And, uh, and you're talking about the, the station's trajectory. The station, that's right. So the space station, and it had to go through um, a very large maneuver. It's pretty unusual for us, but because of the way the vehicle, uh, the drag on the vehicle, this very, very limited atmosphere that's up there, we are able to um, send, we did send a bunch of, a series of commands to, to maneuver the station. It's very propellant, optimal trajectory. Uh, and it was the first time we'd done that. And we did it this morning with no issues at all. So we're very excited. We're in, uh, we're basically mostly in in, the, in our attitude that are, is needed for the docking tonight. Um, and all the other preparations are going fine. Great. Dina, thanks for the, thanks for the, the update. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Expedition 32 Lead Flight Director, Dina Contella.